Okay, great. So, morning everybody. I'm conscious that I'm standing between you and your lunch and we're already running quite late, so I'm going to try and be as quick as I can. Um, please bear with me. Really what I want to share with you today is the journey that we've been on with our partner, Artificial Solutions. Um, and I'm going to wind back in time, um, even before the selection of the vendor was made, um, because I think there's some useful things to learn in that process, and then share with you really the experience we've had as we've gone through the implementations and global rollouts, and how we see uh, AI um, from a, a shell point of view. I think also it's quite interesting in that um, the presentation is different to perhaps the sectors that AI has found its way into first. Um, so we didn't have the benefits of a, a lot of learning in place already in terms of knowledge base. I'm required by the Shell Group to show you this disclaimer, which I know you can't possibly read, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Basically what it says is, basically what it says is that the information that, uh, that we're sharing with you today is, is Shell property, and uh, if you want to reuse it, you just need to ask first. And secondly, that any of the things that we show you are really a viewpoint, that's all. Yeah. So they may be right or wrong, um, as you see fit. Okay. So in terms of the journey, as I already said, I want to lead you through from where we started to what's happened at the end of it. And that's really what the, uh, the content is about. A little bit about the Shell Group, and I'm not going to dwell on this too long. Obviously, we're a fairly large organization. We're actually in over 100 countries in the part of Shell that I reside in and over 90,000 employees, so quite a big and complex business, and earnings of about 3.8 billion. Um, okay. okay, so just skipping on, obviously we're one of the larger oil companies that actually do everything from uh, exploration and production all the way through to manufacturing and the sale of products, be they fuels, lubricants, bitumen, and many other product ranges. So. Um, Okay, so in terms of where, where I sit, um, I sit in the downstream uh, where you see retail and lubricants. So that's the little part that, that we sit in. Um, what I would like to say is that's a, a very important part. Um, and actually from a profitability point of view, it's been growing year on year for many years and is extremely profitable. Okay, so a good place to be. Um, and that's the area where we've actually implement, implemented the uh, virtual assistant. Okay, so obviously retail uh, in a shell context means petrol stations or gas stations if you're American, um, and we have um, many of those in many countries. Um, lubricants uh, means the oils that you put in your cars uh, if you're a B2C customer, or if you're an industrial uh, plant you know, the lubricants, oils and greases that you use in the machines that you uh, produce whatever you make with, okay? So, getting on to the part that's, uh, that's interesting really, the virtual assistant. I don't, I'm sure I don't need to tell anybody what a virtual assistant is, but our initial goals really were around enhancing the customer experience um, and actually trying to divert away, and I think this is a common message that we've heard today, divert away some of those simple calls uh, that are very repetitive uh, and quite easy to answer. So that was our initial idea. Um, we were also, um, because we were in a growing business, um, struggling to resource all of our help desks as we grow. Um, so that was also a, a key consideration. How would we actually continue to scale those whilst at the same time grow and not constrain, that gro constrain the growth <laughs> Uh, by not being able to deal with these questions. So that, they were some of the initial uh, targets. Obviously, we wanted to try and be innovative and be the first in our sector to deliver a service like this, which we were. Um, and we, we wanted to be 24-7 as well. Our help desks, uh, we had initially 24 help desks around the world, um, serving customers in many different languages. And they were Monday, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. So that doesn't always work if you're a customer. You know, your operations don't stop the seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So that was also one of our considerations. Okay, so the first thing that we actually did to try and understand uh, was actually just examine our own processes. And we looked at the um, call logs, if you like, from all of the help desks around the world. And we tried to categorize the various questions that we got. 
Um, and basically, they fell into sort of six main categories. So things like they were wanting documentation about the products, so technical uh, uh, data sheets or safety data she sheets. They wanted recommendations for our products. Now, they can be quite complex uh, because they involve things like the manufacturer model of the equipment or vehicle, things like the specification, the viscosity, um, things like the ambient temperature of the region that you're trying to make this recommendation in. So actually pretty complex questions, to be honest. Um, obviously some simple things around product availability. So, you know, is this particular product available in this particular market? What pack size is it available in? Where can I buy it? All the sorts of things that you'd think around availability. Then around properties, and this was something that the group initially considered to be quite complex. So by properties, I mean chemical properties. So we're down into, um, you know, exactly what is the viscosity or what approvals or specifications a product has. So actually highly detailed, the kind of thing that uh, previously you would have only found in our product data sheets, not in, even in a database. Okay. Um, yeah, application advice, um, competitor conversion, so converting a competitor product to a, to a shell product, uh, and many other things. I mean, the complaints and other really captures um, lots and lots of other things. Um, and obviously, so in there, you would find things like misplaced actions. So, uh, so if somebody came to the virtual assistant or the help desk with a question that we weren't intended to deal with, we needed to know where to send them. Yeah, so where in the organization could they go? Okay. We then further broke that down. Hmm? I'm pressing the wrong one. Sorry about that. Further broke it down, and, and this went into basically 28 further subcategories below those. It's not important that you can uh, read them all, but really just about understanding the, our actual business. What was also clear was that none of this was documented before. So it was the first time it had been done, which might seem surprising, but I think it's pretty common. And also the, the other uh, surprise really is that the knowledge base um, that we needed to actually implement this didn't exist necessarily you know, in a nice database or a nice file or a nice document. A lot of it was in people's heads and the processes that they followed as call center operatives to actually answer a question uh, was intuitive or learned over many years. So if you lose those people, uh, that's really bad. Um, and like many companies, we, we have um, you know, age profile, we have staff turnover. So actually being able to capture the knowledge in a system was a very positive thing as well, just in itself. Okay, so as I say, when we broke it down further, we started to then look at all the nuances below the, the six categories. Um, and that then took us to a, another level. Now, I've, I've actually removed some of the numbers here because I don't want our uh, supplier to get too excited. Um, uh, and also, it's, some of it's a little bit secret, but we'll, I will share some of the numbers with you. So what I'm uh, showing here is the various channels that we either did serve our customers through with technical help um, through to some of the ones that we've implemented in the meantime, and I want to try and explain how that affects our cost base. So over on the right-hand side of this chart are all the human elements where we actually send somebody to see a customer, we answer a phone to a customer with a real person. Um, we were answering around 300,000 calls per year, just to give you an example, across our um, 24 help desks as we started this project. And you can see from the dollar X's the approximate amounts of money involved. Um, and over, at, over on that far right, there's about 25 million of cost, just to give you a rough idea. So significant numbers. Um, as you move over to this side, where you're looking more to self-serve, web-enabled things, chat, um, and various other databases that were able to answer some questions um, on the internet without actually the need of an operative, um, I'll take an example away from this. We introduced something called Lube Match, which actually is an online database to answer some of the product-related uh, recommendations. So what lubricants do you need for your car or things like that? They grew very, very quickly. Um, we're getting, well, it's now over 10 million um, interactions with that system. Um, now, 
that pales in, it makes the original call number pale into insignificance. So that's new traffic as well as diverted traffic. Um, the problem is that, you know, database type searches with drop down menus, which is what loop match is, it's not a great user experience. It's not the nicest thing. But if you put a virtual assistant in front of it and put on a, other knowledge bases behind it and other integrations to other databases behind it, you end up with a one stop shop. Um, that customers can go to that works really seamlessly and that's what we've aimed to do so the virtual assistant has fallen in the middle there and you can see there's a huge huge impact on costs on organization on service quality it, it really has made an immense difference for us okay just a little bit more on the complexity um, so we've around about 3,000 products uh, around about 100,000 product information sheets around that. Um, we've got many different properties of all the lubricants. Um, we've actually got in the database over 31,000 competitor lookups, so that's conversion from somebody else's product to our own, uh, and many other things. And also we had a requirement to be uh, in multiple languages because we're a, a global organization, so a little bit around that. I think I've already spoken about some of the integrations that we needed to make. So we have many databases that have some of the answers. So we have a, a global product catalog database, for example, that contains all our products for every market in the world. And that, contain, that system also contains things like the language translations of the data sheets that you might want to provide as answers to somebody who's asking for a data sheet. So we've had to integrate. Uh, with all of these databases too. So it's not just simple FAQs. It's actually turned out to be highly complex. The other thing that we've had to do, because our, uh, our market or, or sector has not been done before by any uh, AI provider as far as we know, the knowledge bases, even around things like AKAs, so you know the names that you give to things, they didn't exist. So we had to scratch build pretty much all of those, which was quite a big job. Okay. So just winding back then to before the implementation. Um, oops. Yeah, I mean, basically we defined a clear scope, which I think you've seen some of how we, how we actually did that. Uh, we gained support from our management team for the, for the budgets and for the idea. Um, actually, you'd be surprised how engaged they were, um, bearing in mind this is a brand new idea. Um, and actually caused a lot of very uh, fun debates and um, things like that. Yeah. Um, and also this thing started to take on a personality, which is also what we wanted to have. So we went with avatars from the beginning and tried to give some personality in the small talk and things like that, at least within the boundaries of a, a big corporate organization. So there's not too many jokes in there, of course, but, but we did try to give a, some personality. Okay. Um, we turned to Gartner to look at the, uh, the studies to try and, first of all, make a shortlist of um, the, the best companies out there. So that was an extremely useful uh, process. Um, once we'd uh, pre-shortlisted the organizations, we had a sort of initial presentation from them about, um, about their tools and what they could offer. Um, what we then did, um, which I think perhaps isn't done too many times, or at least that's the feedback we got from the vendors that, uh, that came. We, we actually produced a highly detailed document about every type of question that we were likely to be asked. Uh, and for that, we provided example data, scenarios, uh, the clarification process that the user might have to go to, even down to an example snippet of data. Um, the idea being be behind that was that we wanted each of the vendors to go away and actually build it. Okay? Um, so I don't mean build the complete solution, but just around these single examples, and there were about 20 of them, we wanted them to show us how it worked in real life and present it to us almost as a finished product. Um, the engagement we got was excellent, I have to say, from all of the companies, um, but it really did help us separate um, the best companies out of the group. Um, some of that could have just been willingness to do all the work that we were asking them to do, and, and some of it could have just been expertise differences, I don't know, but uh, it's difficult to gauge. But nevertheless, we feel that that process really helped us. Um, okay, so 
Obviously, following that process, we shortlisted further, uh, and then we went uh, to RFQ to get the prices and make our final decision. And in the end, um, the company that we went with was Artificial Solutions. But I, I do have to say that there were a lot of good companies who came. So, okay. Um, we then, obviously, after the um, after the RFQ, we had a, an evaluate, evaluation process. I'll show with you just some of the sort of templates we used for that. Um, we as a team decided what all the criteria were that were important to us about the selection. We gave it weighting and we had team discussions after each presentation to rank them and the natural winner fell out easily yeah, at the end of that process. So it was quite a structured process and bear in mind that different people in, in our own team would have had different views, uh, might have had different preferences, but in the end that didn't matter. It still made the right choice for us. Um, as, at least as far as we see it. Um, okay, so again, you can't read this at all, but this was just to show some of the examples um, that we actually put together. So the top part of this was the table showing one example question, and there are various columns talking about the problems, talking about the clarification process, giving example data, example questions, some of the AKAs that might be needed for, for that to work properly and also detailing what output we wanted at the end. So, you know, if this qu question was asked, what do we want the answer to look like? Um, and that included the visual elements, the presentation, the tables, the extended views, or whatever it was that was required, uh, from our perspective at least, to, to render the right answer. And we challenged each of the vendors uh, quite heavily around that uh, to actually you know, show us exactly what they could do. Um, and at the bottom, this was just a snippet of one of our databases that we were going to have to integrate in order to answer this question. And we put some nasty ones in there because obviously our product names are quite complex. Some of them are very similar. Users never enter it correctly. And so it had to be able to deal with all these sorts of problems. And we put little trip hazards in there for them to, uh, to, uh, to trip up on, basically. Uh, and that also helped us with our assessment. Okay, uh, I mentioned the, uh, the vendor ranking, so we agreed that all of the criteria, we gave them a, a, a ranking, sorry, a weighting, which was that first column over on the right side. And then for each of the vendors, we actually gave them a score. And uh, as I say, the, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth places just fell out uh, quite easily. Okay. Um, obviously, after the selection process, we, we contracted and, and started our implementation. And what I want to share with you now really is some of the key learnings that we had in that process. So um, with our supplier artificial solutions, we actually um, did a couple of things. We put together a, um, a really robust team on our side. So we had an ITPM, uh, we had a, a technology manager, which was myself, which, and I was the, let's say, the, the originator of the idea to do this. Um, we had some knowledge management experts. So we had a lead of that group plus the group of people who were the subject matter experts. And there's absolutely no substitute for having them part of the team right at the beginning. And you cannot enter into this without having those people there. What we did was we workshopped our processes around every question type and built the flows. And I'm sure you rec recognize this. Um, we looked at all the things that we might need, like the decision boxes, the exit points, the the clarifications that might be needed. We looked at all the different question types that could be asked for that same question. Uh, we looked at all of the AKAs that you might need for those and started to build those. And obviously things like the natural language libraries started like this and now they're absolutely massive. Um, and building a new flow now is actually quite easy because a lot of what you need in terms of the key components or the understanding of our business language or the business language the customer would ask the question in, it's already there now. So we've got a super platform to continue growing it. Okay, so we then entered into a pilot in uh, the UK and the US, and the thinking behind that was, uh, well, our US uh, colleagues are always quite challenging. Um, and um, so that was uh, one aspect of it. And also it was a big market with a lot of distributors which was uh, our target really initially uh, for, for this project. Uh, and then the UK, which was a natural fallout because we were sat here, so the team who were doing the implementation work were here. 
um, and also it showed a similar language at least. Okay, so that was the thinking behind it. Um, actually, the pilot was a, a roaring success. Um, went far beyond our expectations, to be honest. So we, we really were thinking to, if we could deflect 10 or 20 percent of the calls, that would be absolutely super. Um, we exceeded that by a long way, and it's continuing to grow. Um, yeah, in terms of the benefits, I mean, it's enabled quite a big organizational change. So um, we went from 24 help desks to seven, and uh, we're, uh, we've moved now to three. Uh, we've increased the sizes of the help desks, so the bigger uh, with more scale. So the, the help desks where we do answer questions with, with real people, they're bigger groups. Uh, the more professional as a result of that being teams in, uh, in various hubs rather than being one man or two man bands in a, in a small market. Uh, somebody's on holiday, it falls apart. Um, so we're actually experiencing much better service from our help desks because they're answering um, some of the more complex, more interesting questions that take longer times. Um, but actually I think the other area that we've exceeded our expectation is that um, Initially, we were trying to do just simple questions because that's what the cynics in our own team believed that that's all that this could ever do. Um, and actually, we've gone well beyond that. Um, we're doing some highly complex things that some of our help desk staff would scratch their heads over. Yeah, so really, uh, you know, very confident in the technology in that sense. Um, from the start, we knew we could do something exciting with it, but we never believed that it would really actually go that far. Okay, so there's, uh, well, there's been a lot of uh, publications in the marketplace about it. This was a kind of a press release about it. That was Emma and Ethan, who were in the UK and US pilots. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the statistics. Um, at the end of the pilot period for the UK and US, uh, we diverted 43% of the calls from the help desk away, and the feedback uh, from customers was absolutely superb, so uh, they loved it. It was faster, it was open all the time, it didn't keep them waiting, they didn't have to deal with an IVR. The comments go on and on and on, but they really like it. Um, and they see it also as quite innovative. Um, the distributors, you can imagine, they're reselling our products, so they've regularly got to do things like converting a competitor product to a shell product. In the past, they would have had to consult one of our experts to get that answer, and it would have taken some time. They could be converting a customer over and having the job of converting 30 or 40 products. That process would have taken days before. Now they can do it in under 10 minutes. So it's a real business enabler um, for the distributors. And also, you can imagine when we take on board distributors for a market, we actually want them to self-serve. That's the whole idea of giving them a very, uh, you know, a very large part of the margin is that they do it for you. Um, but the experience in the past is that a lot of them don't. They still rely on your resources. And so you're not really taking the cost out unless you do something like this. Um, so it's been a, a real revelation in that sense. Okay, so, yeah, 88% of the... Uh, the interactions are, are, uh, we found are now of, of one type, which are product recommendations. Um, that changes, and it's different from country to country, so we've, we've implemented some more countries now, which I'll come on to. Um, but actually, we do get some very strange questions. I know we, we heard a little bit about that this morning. We get some really weird questions. Um, uh, Emma, Emma often gets asked for a date. <laughs> Just a, a bit of humour. I mentioned uh, what our customers say. I mean, there's some quotes here uh, which we've got to approval for external use. We've many more of them. Uh, but the customer satisfaction around the product has been absolutely great. Um, and the, uh, the number of answers that the system isn't able to give is very, very small. So I think that's because of the work we did up front to build the knowledge base. Okay, so in terms of where it resides, it resides in the Shell.com website and also in those of the, the country websites. It's built on the, the Teneo platform provided by Artificial Solutions. It understands context, it understands many AKAs. It's able to 
disambiguate around uh, answers that are, are complex or that have got multiple potential uh, outcomes. Um, it's got memory. Um, it's capable of performing a lot of fuzzy searches, which is quite important for us because our product names <laughs> are highly complex. There's a lot of suffixes, numbers, and letters, as well as the name. Um, uh, in our products, so customers rarely type them correctly. So, in order to actually do that, we've got to make a lot of language objects and also um, deal with the uh, the fuzzy log logic, such that spelling mistakes, typos, uh, dots in the wrong place, all, all the usual trip hazards that you could find are dealt with, uh, and that works extremely well. And uh, yeah, it's free format conversation. So, you know, if somebody asks a question about they'd like a, a lubricant for their VW Golf, um, and they've obviously not given enough information because they've not said the engine size or the fuel type, or um, it will lead you through that process um, uh, in a nice conversational way. And if you ask the question, as, we, as humans we do in many different ways, it deals with that most of the time as well. So we've put a lot of effort into uh, how people might ask questions. Um, obviously, when you start to roll that out into different languages, that gets even more complex uh, because language structure is not the same from one language to another. Um, so you can't just translate it. It's, it's much more complex than that. Um, in terms of deployment since the, uh, the pilots, um, we've deployed um, really across some of our main markets in Asia, so India, Philippines, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, etc. Uh, we've deployed in Germany, so we have some slightly more formal names of uh, the avatars in, in Germany, which <laughs> probably doesn't surprise you. So Julia Wagner and uh, or Wagner and Conrad Muller. Um, we've implemented in China and Russia, and these were some of the most challenging markets because you've got to deal with, um, you know, Cyrillic. Um, you've got to deal with very different language structures, special characters etc. Um, and actually a lot of the databases that were the source information for answering the questions that we had ourselves, um, that we had to integrate to, they didn't even have the language support in them either. Uh, so quite a challenge to do that. And the whole scope of what was in the pilots has been implemented successfully in all of these. And the, the traffic is growing and growing. Um, well, this is what it looks like in some of the different markets. Um, so we've got consistency. Um, we've protected ourselves in a way that we can't in our help desk, which I think is another interesting angle. So uh, when we're actually making recommendations that, uh, let's say, have conditions or are only as good as the data that's provided, we've got legal disclaimers uh, included in there and many other things to protect us, which you can't easily do um, when you're answering calls by help desk. And also we've got the consistency that the answers are being delivered in the same way. Again, you can't do that with human beings. It's not that easy. You can tell them, but, but uh, it doesn't always happen. Okay, so in terms of the outcome, um, well, overall across all of the deployments were 40% reduction um, in the, uh, the calls going to our help desk. Um, over 74% of the issues are resolved successfully, and the feedback itself is extremely uh, good. Um, really very, very successful. In terms of the future, and this is, I think, probably, for me anyway, is the most interesting slide because I don't see ourselves as just a consumer of this product. Um, I like to think that we're, we're innovators, so we're being quite demanding of our current vendor. And we see that this, this uh, artificial intelligence has huge opportunities with our own customers. So. We've heard about all the in different industrial revolutions that there's been over the years, you know, last one being mechanization and automation. Um, uh, but the cyber physical systems that the OEMs, so the manufacturers of equipment in the various sectors that we deal with, are becoming very, very sophisticated. So machines will all be connected. Um, big data it will become a big problem to us all. And, um, AI is actually a really uh, vital key to, to working with that. We've already been asked by some of our end consumers, uh, could we give them uh, a virtual assistant, a rebranded one? Um, because they have help desks having to answer the same questions that we built answers for. The answers are just a different product, 
uh, that we might make for them, um, but we've already been asked that. So the extension of what you deliver to us is already starting to become a pass-through potentially to some of our big customers, because we deal with lots of global key accounts, all the big automotive manufacturers, etc. And they're all thinking about this and they don't know how to do it. Okay, so that's, that's one of the, the, the biggies really. Obviously in terms of what we're going to do in the short to medium term, we're going to continue to deploy it globally. Um, we'd like to use it more for selling, so we've already done some things around um, upsell and cross-sell, but we really want to expand that. Um, we've got to do some work on our data structures to make that work, um, but we believe that we can help customers trade up from uh, mineral products to synthetic products, uh, which will actually give them longer life and, and uh, obviously give us additional revenue as well. Um, so we want to work on that. We definitely want to broaden the knowledge base because we want to take it from uh, being a, a distributor tool, which is sem semi-private, um, although there's no passwords, they're just well hidden. Uh, we want to move it from that to a truly public tool that is facing both B2B and B2C. Um, because we can see huge benefits. Um, we can also see um, integration, in, more further integration in the form of putting this as the face in front of the other services. So the lube match service I was telling you about, its user journey could be enhanced significantly and is being by putting a uh, virtual assistant in front of it. And we see that happening with more of our other systems as well because the user journey is just so much nicer. Yeah, it, finally, really, just um, on, a, on a final note, um, in terms of the way things are changing, uh, we really want to see a proactive VA, a VA that actually um, is able to analyze things that are going on in our other systems and give customers insights about that. Um, and so that's going to re require expert systems, it's going to require handling big data, and then dialogue to actually support communicating those improvements that a customer could make and uh, that's where we would like to take the uh, the technology or one of the things we'd like to do we'd also like to see virtual assistants listening to the um, help desk calls that we uh, continue to support with people and actually offering up answers to our um, helpline assistants that they can then pass on to the customer. Because we still do get calls that could be answered perhaps by the VA. Um, so you can imagine the, uh, the call assistant, you know, is sat at the terminal, they've got the phone, the VA is listening, it's already worked out the answer and given them, them the information. They can still uh, decide whether it's of the right quality and it's the right answer. Um, but if it is, they can have it to the customer really quickly. Uh, so again, that's something we see as improving that experience in the, uh, the help desk as well. Um, just very finally, um, I talked about this cyber, cyber physical world. Um, across our customer base, um, there's something, um, well there's always new buzzwords, but industry 4.0 is the big thing that everybody's speaking about. And it's very much in this space. Um, nobody's really speaking about how AI could help with industry 4.0 but I can tell you it, it really can, and there's huge opportunities uh, in AI for anybody, any of the companies who are sort of trying to lead in the space of Industry 4.0, yeah. That's everything from my side. Do you have any questions? SaaS, so it's software as a service, so uh, it's the application and the hosting and all of that is managed by our supplier, um, but the knowledge base and the deployment of it to our markets is managed by, by ourselves, with some support from them, obviously. Um, what size team do you have for the market there, and does it scale across multiple markets? Uh, actually, there was about six or seven of us uh, involved in the, uh, the work around the knowledge base and the flow design. 
uh, led by myself, um, and that's it. Yeah, um, we did involve people from the local markets, usually one or two people, when we were deploying in their markets because obviously we needed language translation skills and, and things like that. Um, what we also did though was uh, we made the implementation pretty much turnkey, so every bit of data that needed to be managed or translated um, or decided upon in terms of, you know, this is the question, this is the answer. Uh, we provided it all in simple format, so in, in spreadsheets and things like that, or databases, to make it really easy for them to, uh, to deal with. And also then when we implement it back in the tool, as long as uh, nobody changed the columns, it was going to work. Yeah. Excellent. Yep, one, one. I'm so okay. curious. Go ahead. But, but, uh, we're trying to get back in sync. There, there's a mistake on the program, and, oh. and this was done at 12 15, but go ahead, Amy. Well, I was just really curious how you came up with the idea of using the VM, because it seems like a really good use case, and there's a lot of other companies that use it, and something like that. But they don't know what the idea I mean, what's your background? How did you realize what the idea is? Well, I'm an engineer by, that, by background. Um, but I've worked in sales, marketing, and various other places uh, within Shell. So quite a broad background. But I think what really started it was, was two things. It's a very it's a silly thing to story. I sat with our help desk in the Philippines uh, on a night shift just listening to the types of calls that uh, we actually get. And it was obvious to me that there was a lot of repetitive things um, coming in, a, a lot of simple things, and we were asking really great people to ask answer nodding questions. That was the first lightning moment. The second one was, and um, I actually used a virtual assistant to, um, on one of these parcel tracking websites. And I thought, you know what, this could work for us. Let's give it a try. Let's see if it really could. I was still a little bit cynical about it. Um, but you only need to look at your children. Um, you know, like this cyber-physical world that we're describing is a futuristic thing that already exists in there. Um, and um, so I thought, well, let's, let's have a look. And uh, we, we actually visited some customers who deployed it, which the various vendors also sort of offered us as, as um, you know, proof points. Um, they, were, they were all banks, which was a bit of a shame from our point of view. There were no industrial ones. But you could see, yeah, well, we were convinced at that point we could do the simple things. But the truth is you can do a lot of complicated things with it.